Is that working? Yes. 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 Sweet. All right, so um, as Francis said, I've been uh, the lead mechanical designer of our team for the past three years, and that also a similar thing at Hello. Um, so today I just wanted to talk about sort of my experience in that role on our team and also just show you some of what I think are the coolest things that our team has done in this area of our work. Um, so to do that, I'm just going to show you a few of the things that I'm most proud of um, in the mechanical design aspect of our team. First, oh, first. So this is the very first thing that I ever tatted. I just wanted to show you this. Um, just to show you where I'm coming from. Um, I did this in like our team's very first year in FLL. Um, I remember coming back from our very first competition and we just did absolutely horrendously. Everything was breaking the entire day. <laughs> and then the next day I spent, so that was on a Saturday, I came back on a Sunday and for like, from when I woke up to when I went to sleep, I designed that, the first thing I ever tatted. Um, and I really like remembering that because it was the first of many, what would become many, like 13 hour Adam sessions on your desk. So, yeah. And then for those of you who know this is Kellen Martin and me having to build that robot. Alright, so the first thing I want to talk about is a um a turreted disc shooter for a FTC game two years ago called Ultimate Goal. So um that's this robot right here. The goal of the game is to shoot out these orange rings from behind this white line into a goal. So I'll show you that. Um so the actual shooting is a bad example. The actual shooting we had down pretty well. This is a prototype that we made, um, and alongside some like really amazing uh, vision and autoing code that some programmers in our team made, we were able to um, really consistently shoot into the goal from anywhere on the field. But um, that only worked as long as we weren't moving, as long as we weren't getting hit by anybody. So um, that was the design goal that I had in going to try to design what this mechanism would become, is try to find a way that our shooter can shoot rings reliably into the goal, even if we're moving, even if we get bumped by another robot, because those are things that we definitely want to have in the competition. Um, so luckily, a lot of teams out there had thought of very similar things and had created this turreted um, system where the entire shooter was basically on a 360 swivel. This is just a video I found of one of them on YouTube. So you can see this entire mechanism is able to turn around, and then in a second you'll see it face towards the goal and automatically shoot all three. Um, and that's obviously like very, very effective. So that was a place that I started when trying to design this mechanism. Um, but this was our robot at the time. That's the robot I just showed you. They're not at all the same. Um, and alongside having like two weeks till the competition, <laughs> not the best idea to try to like redo our entire design, like the entire fundamental <laughs> principle we were working on for the entire season. So even though this design might have been the absolute best way to do that, um, I would have to try to find a more simpler and less time consuming way to integrate an idea into our already existing robot. So um, this is a video that I took probably at 3 a.m., judging by how light out it is in my room, <laughs> of the um, design that I came up with. So um, it fit very well into our current shooter, which was just a very like 90 degree bend and the ring would get sped up by a flywheel right here and we get shot at the front. But the um, extra innovation that I added was this basically adjustable telescoping clip that will controlled by a servo really precisely would allow the rings to shoot out at various different angles and it could be very precise, it could be very controlled, and alongside the, um, the vision code that I mentioned earlier that could automatically aim towards those goals, it would allow the robot to shoot even while moving or even while being hit because that turret can make really, really fast and really, really precise adjustments. And here's just another video of this actually working. So you can see I have the vision target set up on this is my couch right here. <laughs> and it automatically aims towards it even when the robot isn't in the right orientation. So, thank you. There we go. Yeah, and um, just to 
show you what that actually did to our robot. It was very successful, which is why I'm very proud of it. Um, this is a video we made for our judging presentation. So, moving robot shoots all three rings into the target. And you can see, if you watch the, um, the hood, it'll sort of go like this. And it'll account for the robot's velocity that way by shooting the rings out further this way. So I'll just put that down. It's just very mesmerizing to watch, in my opinion. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And so with that allowed our robot to do that season with something very, very crucial, which was um, move while shooting rings, as I've been saying the whole time. Um, which meant that it gave us like an enormous competitive advantage because we could move to go intake these other rings that were falling out while still scoring them into the goal. So it allowed us to um, basically never have to stop scoring. And also very mesmerizing in my opinion. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just very proud of this mechanism and like the whole design process behind it because even if going for that big like 360 full rotating turret might have been cooler, might have been um, potentially more effective, this is really like a very relatively simple design, a very relatively um, like mechanically not complex, not breakable design. And if you watch like realistically under most of the movements, it's moving like two degrees or something like that to make these tiny little adjustments. Um, so yeah. Second cool thing. <laughs> um, the video, something that we noticed when we saw this was that it worked really well when the barrier hit the wheel from this side. Because if you imagine how it works, it's going to have a lot easier time hitting it up like that than if it hits it from that direction, because it's from that direction, it's kind of jamming it into the axis of rotation, and it gets a lot more locked up. If 
the robot decides to come back in that video, you'll see that the front wheels, there we go, hit the barrier really hard, push the whole thing up, and the back wheels go over a lot more gently. Um, it was also very bouncy, which wasn't ideal. So going into um, the next iteration, which ended up being the last iteration, um, I was essentially trying to find a way that it could act like this mechanism when driven that way, but in both directions, which is how I got this. So I'm just going to let you watch the video because I think it's really cool. It's a lot smoother than the other one. Um, and essentially, it works. I don't know how well everyone can see this, but it's able to deflect up and back one direction using this floor bar linkage and in the other direction, identically. So it essentially does mechanically work like that single arm suspension does, but in both directions. Um, and I'm really proud of this because of like the, um, the quote that Francis always said, like just for tons of time, tons of iterations into this, I think we started in the beginning of September and didn't finish until the end of November. So like a full three months was spent on making iteration after iteration of these designs until we arrived here. So what this allowed us to do in this game was exactly how we imagined it. Um, being able to, like, even if there was someone blocking us, we could just go around them, we could go somewhere else. And, yeah. The third cool thing um, is a differential square drive train. So, um, just to explain what this is a little bit before I go into it, it's essentially like the um, underlying drive base of the robot. So if this robot has what's called mechanical wheels, which are very fast and maneuverable, but not very strong. This robot has a six-wheel drivetrain, which is very strong, but not fast and maneuverable. And the idea behind a differential swerve is that the wheels themselves can rotate to be in any direction, and then can get powered in that direction, meaning that they have the strength of this with the mobility and agility and speed of that. Um, but it's a very mechanically complex system. And I took this on as a project at, during the summer of last season, so after the game was over, so it wasn't being designed for a competition robot or anything like that. It was more like a fun project and also to see if we could get the design working if it ended up being a good idea in the future. So um, essentially it works by these two really big ring gears are powered each by a motor. And if they spin in the same direction, oh, they power these green gears and there's a double gear in the middle which powers the wheel. So if they spin in the same direction, the entire wheel will rotate, like this one. And if they spin in opposite directions, it'll power the wheel. So here's a video of that. And it's just a very satisfying mechanism to see work. Because it's like a really, really cool idea. It doesn't really seem like it would work in practice, but um, it's very, very mesmerizing to watch. <laughs> He's saying that a lot. And here's what it ended up looking like, actually driving around with both pods. Um, it just looks like it's like floating above the surface, which I find really cool. Um, this is also after a fair bit of code because it's very difficult to like tell the motors to control the wheels to the correct position before rotating them and all that sort of stuff. Um, so yeah. And, it didn't end up being the best idea. We were planning on sort of trying it out for this year. Ended up not being the best idea, but still built it into a full prototype right there. And um, yeah, I just find this design very, very mechanically cool. Um, so lastly, just um, I wanted to talk about like why I, as someone who has spent like literally several hours, several thousand hours per year doing FCC, why I like doing that. Um, so first, it's like all the creative and engineering things that I've been talking about, like getting to design and work on so many parts of all three of these robots has been absolutely amazing. It's so cool to like watch the ideas that I have at 3 a.m. on a school night come to life and work in a competition on these robots. Um, second is also 
the competitions, as I just said. Um, it's a very uniquely stressful and amazing experience to watch the thing that you spent like 2,000 hours making very, like go ram against other robots on the field and very, um, with no excuses, try to do the thing that you tried to um, get it to do. I remember one of my proudest moments from this season was at our very first qualifier, our robot had been breaking down all day. And then finally we had one match where everything just seemed to all pull together and all work. And I remember saying to Chris, like, that's actually what we designed it to do. And that was just one of my proudest moments. And this is a picture that I put in because this is Jamie looking at something very clearly going terribly in the <laughs> so, Although there's a lot of the proud moments, there's a lot of the just pure agony watching everything <laughs> destroy itself. And then lastly, it's just the amazing community that um, I know everyone on our team has found through first, both inside of our team, becoming amazing friends with each other, and also with wonderful other teams such as GNC. Um, Getting to connect with people in FTC from in our communities to all around the world at the World Championships is just an absolutely amazing, incredible thing. So yeah.